Okay, I'm very excited to have on the Goldstein on Gelt show, Jeff Yeager, who has worked in a senior capacity as a CEO, but actually he's probably even more famous as just one of the biggest cheapskates in the country. In fact, he wrote a book and many books about how to be a cheapskate. Uh, Jeff, real pleasure to have you. It's my pleasure to be on with you. I love to talk cheap with you. <laughs> I know that I am uh, I'm not insulting you by by talking, referring to you as a cheapskate. In fact, you know, one of the books you wrote, How to Retire the Cheapskate Way, what's the difference between the way cheapskates retire and the way, you know, normal people do? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And let me start by saying that when I say cheapskate, I don't mean it in a pejorative sense. I like to have some fun with the topic. Call us frugal, call us thrifty, call us just smart consumers. I have the pleasure of writing about a very rare breed of American and, and pretty rare these days any place are people who um, really know what they want out of life. And in this case, what they want out of retirement. And it's not about sacrifice or deprivation. It's about figuring that out. And realizing that you can make your money go a long way and be even happier because of it. So you're saying that, that living cheaply is not suffering, it's living by choice. It, it's in, in my vernacular, it's not about sacrifice or deprivation. It's all about the choice we make every day when we decide what it is we're going to spend and what it is we're going to consume. Here's a shocking statistic. People say, Jeff, you're a notorious cheapskate. What are you giving up in life? There was a study a while back that showed that at least here in America, Americans express regrets about 80% of the discretionary items they buy within a year of having purchased them. And maybe they don't retire regret it entirely, but you know that feeling of buyer's remorse. So when people say, what are you giving up? I like to think cheapskates like me are just trying to think about it in advance and think, gosh, we're prepared to spend on that 20% of the stuff that we won't regret that really makes us happy, but we're not foolish enough to spend on the 80% of stuff that most people do that ultimately disappoints them. So really what you're saying is that we're not looking for buying things that make us happy, but we're looking for the things that make us happy, some of which might cost money, but some of them which may not. Yeah, there's a big difference, at least here in America, between amassing a quality of life and amassing a quantity of stuff. And the folks I write about, and I don't claim they're common, they're, you know, they're not your, when I say cheapskate, they're not a Scrooge, they're not greedy, they're not pe people who are trying to pinch pennies just for the sake of having a big bank account. In fact, for one of my books, I surveyed 320 uh, so-called self-described cheapskates, and I found some interesting things, like um, they tend to donate twice as much to charity as an average American. These are people who, who oftentimes say, sure, I could afford to spend more, but why would I? Because it wouldn't make me any happier. And those are the that, those are the touchstone words for me and what I'm always uh, looking at. I also found that, for instance, uh, those Americans I serve, cheap seats I survey, were, ha were twice as likely, again, to have a passport and have traveled outside the United States as the typical American. So they're prepared to spend on things oftentimes experiences as opposed to material objects. They're fully prepared to spend on on the things that they value, but they're not going to get caught up in the race to try to impress other people buying whatever everybody else is buying today. <laughs> so what do you feel about this concept of budgeting? In other words, a lot of people are out there promoting, you know, have a good budget and keep track of your spending and, and focus on the budget. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people feel that budget is a, is a dirty word. How does that fit into your world? Worldview. <laughs> yeah, you're asking some good questions, and, and there again, I was surprised when I surveyed these cheapskates. A minority of them reported having anything like a written budget. As one of them told me, we live our budget, we don't spend time writing it down on paper. So these are really, these are really black belts of smart spending. Uh, they understand uh, what's a good value. Uh, they shop much less than the typical American, so they're not running hither and yon buying stuff that they don't need just because it's a good price. Um, so they've sort of internalized their budget, and, I, and I'm not anti-budget. I think particularly if you have a spending problem and if you have debt, you need to work your way out of that, and a budget can be a useful tool. But, but, but when I survey these cheapskates that I write about, I find that they report that they think about and worry about money much less than their spendthrift counterparts. Mm -hmm. 
So they're really black belts of smart spending. And, uh, they're they're, <laughs> they're not term. they're not misers, if you will. All right, so you can enjoy your life, you can spend it. We're talking with Jeff Yeager, who wrote a number of books about being a cheapskate, how to retire the cheapskate way, the ultimate cheapskate's roadmap to true riches. So let's focus on that one for a little bit more, because we like to talk to people about investing. And one of the things that you know I see ads for, and I got to disclaim this, is that I am a financial advisor and I charge people for financial advice. But a lot of people seem to get all wrapped up. They go, oh, look, I can get, you know, 200 free trades or a free IRA. And so they think that they, they're, I mean, to me, this seems like uh, it's a sucker's bet sometimes because that, you know, what they're saving on one hand, they're just messing themselves up on the other because let's say, for example, they're not expert investors, but they're buying something for cheap. It seems like what they make up on, what they uh, lose on each transaction, they make up on volume. Right, right, right. Yeah, they they know the price of everything and the value of nothing, uh, and 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 let me just yeah, let me just say this. Um, I I don't come from an investing background. I write nothing about investing. I don't know about that. There's lots of intelligent people like like yourself that do know about that. I write only about the spending side of personal finance because I contend that it's just as important as how much you're you're making through investments or whatever. And it's very controllable. It's something we all do every day. We can can control it within certain boundaries. As I like to say, I don't write books about how to get rich. I write books about how to get happy, perhaps with what you already have. Uh huh. And how does saving fit into that? You know, I have various advice on it in terms of, of um, I found that, again, through my survey, that cheapskates have a very, un, at least un-American style of savings and budgeting. They're socking away uh, a, a full 20% of their earnings into savings and or charitable uh, activities, which is far above at least the, the U.S. average, which is typically a negative number uh, in terms of savings. And again, they're doing that at all different income levels. And I mean, I don't write for people who are truly impoverished, but at least here in America, that's not most of us. I mean, Mm -hmm. we have a lot of people with a lot of money and some people with not so much money. But again, just by reining in something like discretionary spending, that statistic I mentioned about 80% of the discretionary stuff we buy, we regret. You know, how is that about sacrifices if you give up some of that? Uh, spend fully on the 20% that really makes you happy, but figure out what that's going to be. Yeah, these days, I mean, there seems to be so much pressure. And in fact, the younger generation seems to have more and more pressure to be satisfied with material goods, you know, from their smartphone to all the other goodies that they buy. You know, what do parents tell their kids when they want to tell their kid, listen, you know, I know everyone's got this, but we're learning a new lesson. Yeah, and and I, I always make it a point to say in interviews, my wife and I have been married for over 30 years. We don't have any children, mm-hmm. uh, and that wasn't an economic decision. Um, and so I don't, I, I personally don't give advice uh, about raising children cheap to sell, but I do have among my my 2,000 miser advisors, all kinds of people who have families and plenty of kids, usually raising them very successfully on less than their counterparts are. And so I have interviewed them and surveyed them, and a number of things pop up. I mean, cheapskates are into delayed gratification, if you want. We spend, mm-hmm. we practice spending procrastination, put off till tomorrow what you could just as well buy today. Sure. And they, they enforce that with their kids. Here's an interesting little tip that one of the parents told me. He said, you know, whenever one of my kids come to me and says, Dad, take me out. I want to buy something new. He says, I'll gladly do that, but first go clean something you already own. Clean something you already own. And he said, inevitably, the child goes starts to clean an object that he already owns, becomes mesmerized with it, and it forgets entirely <laughs> that he wanted something new. I think that's great advice for kids. It's probably good advice for many adults, too. Uh, as, another, as another mother told me, and this was about holiday spending and not giving their kids everything they wanted as soon as they wanted, they said, you know, Jeff, we love our children too much to spoil them. And I'm not carping on parents, because I'm, I'm not one, but, you know, out of the goodness of your heart, you want to give your kid everything they want as soon as they want it. But the thing is, ultimately, I think that's teaching an unhealthy lesson. It's teaching the lesson that in life you get everything you want as soon as you right. want it, even if you can't uh, afford it. There's a guy in America, uh, Kinky 
Friedman, you know, kind of a country philosopher, who said something I thought was really funny. He said, "You know, in a way, a happy childhood is the least possible is the least desirable preparation you can have to be an adult." <laughs> no, I think that's a big issue. I saw I was shopping a while ago, and I saw a kid ask his father for something, and the father told him no, and the kid said, "Oh, this is that delayed gratification thing again, Dad, right?" <laughs> And the father said, yeah, it's exactly what I'm teaching you. And the kid says, I know. I'm engaging in delayed gratification, only I'd like to get it now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's a real challenge. So I think it's a real challenge. But certainly the most important thing is to, is to set the example yourself. And if you're not going to live with, uh, with boundaries in your own spending, then there's no way you're going to teach your kids to do it. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. And as another parent told me, he said, you know, if you show me a spoiled child, I'll bet you I can show you that mm -hmm. his spoiled parents that you know if if the parents are spending beyond their means and getting everything that they want as soon as they want it even if they're putting it on charge cards well, what lesson does that send to the child i mean that's the way life is yeah so let's wrap up with the, the lesson that you started with i just want to see if this is really the number one lesson that uh, our listeners today should take away is that you need to prioritize and Really think about what you want and spend your money on that, but realize that probably so much of the other things out there you're spending money on, you may not really want. Is that is that is that a good takeaway? Yeah, that's the main that's the main part of it. Decide what enough is for you. What enough money and enough stuff will look like. Everybody's answer is going to be different. I mean, I'm a notorious cheapskate, so what's enough for me may not be enough for anybody else. But you know, we live in a day and age where we can spend unlimited time running after more money and more stuff. But the thing we know for sure, Doug, is we only have so much time here on this earth. And how can you value money and stuff more than your time beyond a certain point? All right. I think that's great advice. Jeff, in the last few seconds, just tell us, how can people follow you and follow your work? Well, uh uh, my website is ultimatecheapskate.com. My books are, I've written four of them, and they're still available in bookstores, very available online, Amazon, and and uh, and other places. And, and also, look for me along the road. I'm a big traveler. I'm going to spend much of the next few years traveling the world. And uh, uh, and so, maybe, maybe I'll run into you somewhere. All right. I hope we'll run into you here in Israel. We'll put links to, to the books at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. Jeff Yeager, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Stay cheap. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt show with Money Maven, Doug Goldstein. Check out all of Doug's money ideas at goldsteinongelt.com. Doug specializes in helping people who live outside the United States handle their U.S. investment accounts. If you have a question that you would like answered on the air or off, contact Doug at his website or send him an email to doug at profile-financial.com.